Today I want to speak to you on the subject of how to pray for your unsaved loved ones. Uh, many of you that listen are followers of Christ. Many of you are uh, Christians. You consider yourself Bible-believing Christians. And therefore, if we are Christians, we believe in the content of the Scripture. And the Bible tells us that there is no greater cause than winning the lost. Jesus said in Luke chapter 19 and verse 10, he said, I came to seek and to save the lost. But the question that comes in by hundreds and thousands through the years is, how do I pray for my family or for my loved ones or for family friends, people that I know and that are dear to my heart who do not know Christ or rebel against the things of God, how specifically do you pray for them? And that's what we're going to be teaching today. Uh, in our time together, I want to show you uh, seven biblical keys to exactly how we pray for unsaved loved ones. And many people know they should pray, but they've not received any specific dedicated teaching on what does the Bible say about prayer concerning those who are unreached, those who are unsaved, and the Bible does speak to that. And so that's what our study is going to focus on today. Seven biblical keys on how to pray for your unsaved loved ones. And at the end of our time together, I want to do something that I believe is special. And that is, I want to take time to agree with you in prayer. Many of you don't have people who agree with you in prayer uh, for these vitally important issues. But we're going to, at the end of our study to today, we're going to pray together for your unsafe family, children, grandchildren, husband, wife, whatever the situation might be, and never underestimate the power of prayer. Uh, go into your Bible into 2 Peter chapter 3. As always, if you're a new student with us, uh, be sure you have a Bible, be sure you have a way of taking notes, and be sure you have a highlighter as we go through some uh, very important passages of Scripture in each and every Bible study together. Second Peter chapter 3, go down to verse 8, and I'm reading today out of the New Living Translation. There the Bible says, But you must not forget this one thing, dear friends. A day is like a thousand years to the Lord, and a thousand years is like a day. The Lord isn't really being slow about his promise, as some people think. No, he is being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but he wants everyone to repent. And I want you to pause long enough to highlight those important words in verse 9. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, or perhaps your version of the Bible says perish. It means face judgment for unrepented sin. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to repent. But the day of the Lord, verse 10, but the day of the Lord will come as unexpectedly as a thief. Then the heavens will pass away with a terrible noise, and the very elements themselves will disappear in fire, and the earth and everything on it will be found to deserve judgment. Since everything around us is going to be destroyed like this, what holy and godly lives you should be living looking forward to the day of God and hurrying it along. On that day, he will set the heavens on fire and the elements will melt away in the flames. But we are looking forward to the new heavens and new earth he has promised, a world filled with God's righteousness. And so, dear friends, while you are waiting for these things to happen, make every effort to be found living peaceful lives 
that are pure and blameless in his sight. And remember, the Lord's patience gives people time to be saved. This is what our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you with the wisdom God gave him. As always, let's take a moment to pray together. Father, once again, thank you for another day. Thank you for life and for health and for strength and for all of your blessings. Every good and perfect gift comes from your hand, and we acknowledge you. We thank you for the word of God that is eternally true. We thank you that the Bible is a living book and that it speaks to us in ways that are life-changing. I give you praise today that there is no power of sin or bondage or addiction greater than the power of God's grace and forgiveness. I ask you to anoint our words and our time in Bible study today. I pray for every single person who's listening. Bless them for taking time in their lives to pause and to study the word of God. I pray that the scriptures today would encourage them and point them in the ways of God and above all, keep us all ready for your soon return. If there are those who are listening who are not saved or are away from God, I pray that through today's time that they'll feel the Holy Spirit drawing them back to Christ. Keep us ready for your soon return. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. And all God's people said a big amen. Uh, I don't know where I'd even begin to explain to you the hundreds and countless thousands of people through the years in my four decades plus of ministry who have come to me uh, many times broken, many times with tears in their eyes, asking for prayer for the salvation of their husband or their wife uh, or their children or their grandchildren or uh, the name mentioned of a loved one and so on. But many people don't even know how to pray or where do we begin when we pray for unsaved loved ones. And so I want to take you into the scriptures today and I want to show you seven biblical keys for praying and praying with results, praying for your unsaved loved ones. And I hope that you'll take notes and let's begin. Number one, when we study the Bible and the subject of how to pray for our unsaved loved ones, the first biblical key that I want you to write down is all prayer begins with recognition of your heavenly father. This is just one of the fundamental primary points and foundational truths of how to pray. All prayer begins with recognition of your heavenly father. Uh, Going to Matthew's gospel and the uh, sixth chapter and go down to verse five. And let me read from verse 5 through verse 10. Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 through 10. There the Bible teaches us, when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites who love to pray publicly on street corners and in the synagogues where everyone can see them. I tell you the truth, that is all the reward they will ever get. But when you pray, go away by yourself, shut the door behind you, and pray to your Father in private. Let me just pause for a moment. The biblical instruction for the foundational uh, introduction of prayer is we pray to the Father. Now, it's not a sin uh, to pray to Jesus or, you know, I've heard people pray and address the Holy Spirit, but that's not what the Bible teaches us about prayer. The Bible says, pray to the Father in private. Let's read on. Then your Father, 
who sees everything will reward you. When you pray, don't babble on and on as people of other religions do. They think their prayers are answered merely by repeating their words again and again. Don't be like them. For your heavenly Father knows exactly what you need before you ask him. Pray like this. Our Father in heaven, may your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come soon. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So one of the seven keys, not just for praying for unsaved loved ones, but for prayer as its own subject matter and as its own theology, is all prayer, regardless of what we're praying about, begins the same way. It begins with the acknowledgement and the recognition that you're praying to your Heavenly Father. And you address Him with humility. And you address the Father with sincerity. And that recognition that He and He alone is your source. Uh, many people treat prayer time like Amazon Prime. You just want to type in your order and get it done, ask God for what you want, and then you want it delivered to your door in 24 to 48 hours. Prayer doesn't work that way. All prayer begins with the humility and the honor of addressing your holy, heavenly Father. Number two, you must remove all doubt in your heart that it's God's will to save your loved one. Number one, we begin with the recognition of our Heavenly Father. Number two, you must remove all doubt that it is God's will for your loved one to be saved. A lot of people are not aware of this. And they think, well, some people have been uh, prejudged. Some people were born with a curse on their life and nothing will ever change. And some people are destined to go to heaven and some people are destined to go to hell. The Bible does not teach that. The Bible clearly teaches that it is always God's will for people to be saved. I repeat, be sure you write it down. It is always God's will for people to be saved. People say, well, why aren't all people saved if it's God's will? Because there's human choice involved in that. Uh, just as some of you as parents or as grandparents, there are certain things that you wish and will that your children would do, but your children have minds of their own, of their own and they may not listen to your advice or your counsel, and they're quite independent. You may have a will, but just because you as a parent have a will does not necessarily mean that the child is going to carry out that will. And the same is true between God the Father, who wills that all should be saved, but some people rebel against God. Now, let me back that up with some Bible verses, and that could be a teaching all on its own. But uh, go into Mark chapter 11. Mark chapter 11, verses 22 through 24. Then Jesus said to the disciples, Have faith in God. I tell you the truth, you can say to this mountain, May you be lifted up and thrown into the sea, and it will happen. But you must really believe it will happen and have no doubt in your heart. Highlight those words. You must really believe it will happen and have no doubt in your heart. I tell you, you can pray for anything. And if you believe that you've received it, it will be yours. If you have doubt that God wants to save your loved one or your family member or your son or your daughter or your grandchildren, etc., if you have doubts in your heart that it's God's will for them to be saved and somebody has pushed into your subconscious the thought 
that perhaps <clears throat> they're destined to live under the curse of sin, then you'll never be able to pray with authority and with power and with faith. If you're going to have effective prayers, one of the first things that you must settle is what is God's will. Once you know something according to the Bible to be God's will, then you can pray with a different level of faith and expectation and certainty that it will come to pass. And as you study the New Testament, of course, salvation is a New Testament doctrine. There was no salvation prior to Christ. God's only son became the sacrificial lamb, the sinless, pure lamb of God who willingly gave his life upon the cross and through the shedding of his blood, salvation became available. And so the doctrine and the theology of salvation is a New Testament theology, though we see types and shadows of salvation, even in the Old Testament, it was not available until the life, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's go over into uh, 1 Timothy, the Apostle Paul's first letter to his son in the ministry, Timothy, and chapter 2, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 through 6. Listen to what the Bible says here. This is good and pleases God our Savior, who wants everyone to be saved and to understand the truth. Pause right there and highlight that. God our Savior, who wants everyone to be saved and to understand the truth. For there is only one God and one mediator who can reconcile God and humanity, the man, Christ Jesus. He gave his life to purchase freedom for everyone. Highlight that. He gave his life, Jesus. He gave his life to purchase freedom for everyone. The Bible is clear on this. Salvation is for everyone. God wants everyone to be saved. He is willing that none should perish, but all should come to repentance. Throughout the teaching of the New Testament, one thing is irrefutable. God made salvation available for all. Do all receive it? No. The Bible says in Matthew 7, the road that leads to heaven is straight and narrow, and few there be that find it. But the road to hell is wide and broad, and many there be that travel thereby. So not all receive it, but settle the doubt. It is always God's will for your loved ones to be saved. So what does that eliminate from your prayer? It eliminates a prayer like this. Lord, if it's your will for my son to be saved, or Lord, if it's your will for my daughter to be saved, or Lord, if in your sovereign ways it's your desire for my husband to... No, you never pray a prayer. Listen, you never pray a prayer that violates what God has stated in the Bible. Your prayers must agree with the word and the will of God. So settle your doubts once and for all. Number three, be sure that your personal conduct and character set the right example. You know, it's very difficult for your loved ones to see their need of Christ if you claim to be a Christian, but you're living worse than they are. And that happens. There are many people, they go to church, they wave their Bibles around, they claim to be Christians, but in their regular life, Monday through Saturday, they live worse than most sinners do. And you're never going to have an effective witness and an effective prayer life if it's not even working in your own life. 
The power of God needs to work in you before it can work through you. The power of God must work in you before it can work through you. Many of your loved ones are paying far more attention to your life than to your words. I want to say that again. You may not know it, but it's true. Your unsaved family, your unsaved loved ones, if you're proclaiming to be a Christian, they're paying very careful attention to your life more than your witness and your words. That's why many of you who are Christians, the moment you do anything wrong or you say something wrong or you cuss or you do something, your unsafe family will call you to task on it. I thought you were a Christian. Are, are Christians allowed to do that? Do Christians talk like that? I heard you went to such and such a place of entertainment. I, I didn't think Christians were allowed to do that. Unsaved people will call you out on your inconsistencies and upon your own spiritual weaknesses. And so if you're going to have the ability to pray for people, the power of God must work in you before the power of God will work through you. Uh, let's go to 2 Thessalonians since we're right nearby there from 2 Timothy. 2 Thessalonians, verse 11 and 12 of the first chapter. 2 Thessalonians, chapter 1, verses 11 and 12. So we keep on praying for you, asking our God to enable you to live a life worthy of his call. May he give you the power to accomplish all the good things your faith prompts you to do. Then the name of our Lord Jesus will be honored because of the way you live. Highlight that. Then the name of our Lord Jesus will be honored because of the way you live. And you will be honored along with him. This is all made possible because of the grace of our God and Lord Jesus Christ. Your life and your example are blazing a trail far more visible than your words and your witness. And if your children and your loved ones follow your example, are you leading them to heaven or through your inconsistencies, are you leading them to hell? There is a personal responsibility in prayer that our lives are in harmony with what we are praying about. Number four, when you pray, you need to take authority over the spiritual blindness that prevents your loved ones from seeing their need of Christ. When you pray for your unsaved loved ones, you need to pray taking authority over the spiritual blindness that keeps them from seeing their need of Christ because the Bible clearly teaches us that people who are unsaved are spiritually blind. It's not an intellectual problem. It's not an academic problem. It's not a social problem. Unsaved people are spiritually blind. They can't see it. They're bound and they're blinded by their sin and the curse of sin. People who are unsaved and uninterested in the things of God are spiritually deaf, dumb, and blind. And the Bible tells us so. Uh, go to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians and the 4th chapter and verse 4. Now I really want you to be sure to get this verse highlighted in your Bible. This is an incredibly powerful gold nugget in the area of dealing with unsafe family, friends, and loved ones. Second Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. Listen to what it says. Satan, who is the God of this world, has blinded the minds of those who don't believe has blinded the minds of those who don't.
don't believe. They are unable to see the glorious light of the good news. They don't understand this message about the glory of Christ, who is the exact likeness of God. In other words, the Bible tells us that unsaved people are influenced by a demonic blindness. They are literally, spiritually, deaf, dumb, and blind to the things of God. Uh, Ephesians uh, and the sixth chapter. Ephesians and the sixth chapter and verse 12. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly world. Places. So the Bible is very clear. Unsaved people, all unsaved people, are spiritually under a demonic spiritual attack that renders them spiritually deaf, dumb, and blind. And I'm not saying that in a critical way. Spiritually, they may have a PhD, they may have a terminal degree in whatever their field of skill is. But no matter what their IQ is, if they're not living for the Lord, they are under the influence of spiritual deafness, blindness, and ignorance. But only, don't miss this, only the Holy Spirit can convict people of sin and convince them of their need of Christ. But as believers, greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. Christ gave us as his followers through his death, burial, and resurrection, he gave to us a spiritual authority that is greater than the weapons of our enemies, even active in family and friends. Matthew chapter 16 and verse 19, the Bible says, I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So when you're praying for your unsaved loved ones, you need to take authority over whatever the known sins are. If they're battling with alcoholism or addictions or drugs or lust or adultery or whatever the sins are. God knows you don't have to hire a private investigator. God knows. But if you're aware, if they're your loved ones and you have conversations with them, many of you know exactly what the weapon is that's being used against them in spiritual blindness. And you can take authority in your prayers. Father, in the name of Jesus, I take authority over the addicting power of every drug. I take authority over the spirit of alcoholism and whatever is binding them and binding them. I pray in Jesus' name you would loose them and set them free. You have the authority of Christ working in you. Jesus, before he ascended into heaven, told his followers, whatever you've seen me do, these things you will do, and greater things than these will you do, because I go to my Father which is in heaven. And Jesus, who had authority over all demonic power, has given that same authority to his children. And when you pray, quit praying like a little, whimpering, defeated saint. You are a mighty warrior of God. You are the sons and the daughters of the Lord. And you need to square your shoulders. And I'm talking about with humility. But I'm talking about knowing when you pray as a child of God, you have spiritual authority over the weapons of sin and Satan and sickness and curse and lack and so on. The power of Christ in us is greater than all forces that oppose us. Number five, pray in agreement with the scriptures. 
Don't miss this. This is one of the most powerful things in all forms of prayer that I'll ever be able to teach you. If you want to have a life of prayer and power, pray in agreement with the Holy Scriptures. Before you pray, many of you would do well to sit down and find out what does the Bible say about the warfare that I'm involved with? What did God say about the things that I'm praying for? And sit down and write out the scriptures that God has addressed. Now, we're specifically teaching on how to pray for your unsaved loved ones. And I'm giving you, if you're paying attention, I'm giving you multiple verses from the Bible that should now be incorporated, incorporated into your prayer life. Let me give you an example. In our text in 2 Peter 3, I told you to highlight that verse where the scripture said that God is willing that none should perish, but all should come to repentance. So to incorporate that into your prayer life, you begin praying, Father, I thank you that you have already stated in your word that you're willing that none should perish. And you can insert the name of your loved one there. You're willing that David shouldn't perish, that Martha shouldn't perish, that Jessica shouldn't perish, that Thomas shouldn't perish, and begin to put the names of your loved ones there and pray in agreement with what the Bible says. Because it's not just a book, it is a living book. It is the sword of the Spirit. And the Bible tells us that God has given us spiritual weapons in our warfare. And the sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. And so when you begin to incorporate the Bible in your prayer life, it's like taking a sword into battle and beginning to cut and slash the chains that bind those that you're praying for. Father, I thank you that you so love this world, that you gave your only begotten Son, that whosoever should not perish, and that whosoever includes my husband, or my wife, or my grandchild, etc., and begin to pray through the power of the Bible. In John chapter 15 and verse 7, Jesus said, But if you remain in me, and my words remain in you, you may ask for whatever you want, and it shall be granted. Number six, persevere in prayer for your unsaved loved ones. Don't just pray once lightheartedly and say, well, good to go. No, persevere. Passionately pray. Persistently pray. Until you get an answer to prayer. Ask and keep on asking. Seek and keep on seeking. Knock and keep on knocking. And the door will be opened unto you. I remember many years ago in one of our Lost Lamb events in South Hills, Pennsylvania, we utilize as a part of our strategy in our Lost Lamb outreaches what's called a Lost Lamb Covenant. And by the way, those are available on our website for free. It's simply a covenant where you can write down the names of seven people, tuck it in your Bible, and make a commitment to God to persistently pray for them. We send those ahead to every event, to every church, to every outreach, at least a month in advance. And we ask those who are in charge or pastors or church leaders, pass these out to the people and ask the people to write down the names of people that need the Lord, loved ones, whoever they're going to invite, and pray for them persistently for the month before I come. Again, I said it before, I'll say it now. Only the Holy Spirit can convict people of sin and convince them of their need of Christ. And as people begin to pray, I believe heaven begins to move. And this is just an illustration, and I could give you dozens upon dozens upon dozens. But on the last night of that Lost Lamb Crusade in South Hills, Pennsylvania, a teenage girl had asked to meet me. One of the altar workers came up to me. It was a large church at that time, probably uh, 12 to 1,400 people. 
and one of the altar workers came to me and said, uh, there's a teenage girl that would like to meet you. She has a wonderful testimony she'd like to share. And so he took me over and introduced me to this uh, young lady. I think she was 17 years old, and she had a group of her friends with her. And she was crying, and many of them were crying, but it was tears of joy. And she said, I just wanted you to know that I have been praying every day for weeks before you came, I wrote down seven names of my seven best friends in school, and I invited them to come. And all seven of my friends have given their hearts to Christ in this week of meetings. And not only that, she then shared this. She said, I don't know if this was God or if it just co was coincidence but they got saved in the order that I wrote them down. Number one got saved first. Number seven got saved last. And she introduced me to the last two. She said, literally said this, this is number six and this is number seven and her name is such and such and her name is such and such. You can't tell me that that's accidental. You can't tell me that that was freak coincidence that she writes down the name of seven people, seven of her best friends in school who didn't know Christ, and every day for a solid month or weeks before I came, prayed for them, lifted their names up in the presence of God, began to claim their souls for Jesus Christ, and in a week's time, all of them came to know the Lord? That's not happenstance. There's power in your prayers. There is power when a Christian prays. And most importantly, when you pray the word of God, when you pray with the sword of the spirit in your hand, I command every power of hell, loose your rotten grip off of my family. Loose them and set them free. I claim them for the Lord Jesus. I curse every sin, everything that blinds them, everything that binds them. And you begin to persistently, passionately, fervently pray. And God will answer your prayer. 1 Corinthians 5 and 17 tells us that we should pray without ceasing. In Acts chapter 16, verses 30 through 31, the Bible said, Then he brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved along with everyone in your household. What God does for one man, he'll do for any man. What God does for one woman, he'll do for any woman. And you can pray and say, Father, just as you saved an entire household in the book of Acts, I lay claim to that for my entire household. I lay claim to every single person in my family that they'll all come to know the Lord Jesus Christ before it's eternally too late. Many of you have heard me share the testimony through the years that my father was the very first member of his family to be saved. And then he met my mother going into ministry, four boys, all four of us are saved. All four of us are in the ministry. All of our children are saved. All of our children are also in the ministry. And the grandchildren thus far, all saved. Some of them already in the ministry. That's not accidental. That's the power of God to change a household and to change your last name into a name that belongs to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And not just you, but your entire family household name. My wife, Judy, was the very first member of her family to be saved. And I've watched her through the decades of our marriage pray almost every day without fail for the salvation of her sisters and her brother-in-laws and her nieces and her nephews. And I don't know how many are saved, but all of them except for maybe one or two. There are but a few left 
in that entire family who have yet to come to Christ and we're believing as we agree in prayer that all of her family shall also be saved. Never underestimate the power of persistent prayer. Uh, there's a name that I want to give you, and when you have time, study it, because it's just uh, a rich history of God moving a tremendous man of God. His name was George Mueller. He was a Christian evangelist and also the director of the Ashley Down Orphanage in Bristol, England. He had, and this is many years ago, but he had 10,024 orphans that passed through that faith home in his lifetime. He established 117 schools which offered Christian education to more than 120,000 people in his lifetime. His life in faith and prayer miraculously sustained the needs of this large orphanage. I wish I had time to share the incredible miracle stories of how God day by day provided for that ministry as large as it was without begging and pleading as he's done for Lost Lamb Association through the years. But a lot of people are not aware of the fact that George Mueller kept a prayer journal. And after his death, his prayer journals revealed 50,000 plus specific answers to prayer that he personally had documented. During his lifetime, he had prayed for five of his dearest friends, but they were unsaved. These five friends were unsaved businessmen who lived in the area of his orphanage, that though they were not Christian men, though they were not interested in the gospel that George Mueller preached, they were men of generosity. And many times, no doubt, under the direction of God, these men would drop by and ask what needs the orphanage had. And they helped George Mueller. And these men found a place in his heart. And he prayed for them faithfully. After five years of persistent prayer, only one of them came to Jesus Christ. After more than 10 years of prayer, his journals revealed that two more of them came to Christ. After 25 years of daily praying for these men, the fourth man was saved. But at the time of George Mueller's death, the fifth man had never received Christ. But just a few short months after George Mueller passed, the fifth man, gave his heart to Jesus Christ. And these five men who were very successful in the world, who had a place in their heart for the work of the Lord, but they themselves did not want the gospel that George Mueller preached, he privately and quietly and persistently began to pray for them. And one day in heaven, they were all reunited. The same can happen for you. And I close with this number seven. Certain things, the Bible says, will never happen without prayer and fasting. One of the ways that we can fortify our prayer life is to join with our prayers the power of fasting with prayer. Fasting from the Hebrew word tzam, which means cover your mouth, not eating. Have you ever taken time to fast and to pray for your unsaved loved ones? Have you ever said, God, I'm going to take at least one day a month or one day a week and I am going to pray and I am going to fast for the salvation of of my entire household. There is power in fasting and in prayer. And sometimes when things seem impossible, and sometimes when things seem to have no breakthrough whatsoever, it seems like little or no progress is being made or even ground is being lost. 
you can go to the Father in the privacy of your prayer closet and join your prayer and your fasting together and begin to bombard the demonic influences that have a place and a hold. But I am here to tell you that greater is he who is in us than he who wrestles in the hearts of unsafe family and loved ones. And I want to conclude by challenging you to listen to this teaching, not just today, but if you are wrestling for the salvation of your family, we're going to pray in just a moment, but if you're wrestling for the salvation of your family, listen to this on a regular basis and get these seven biblical principles on how to pray for your unsaved loved ones deep within your heart and begin to practice them and begin to carry them out. And the power of God who has given us precious promises will keep his word. God cannot lie. And he said, I'm willing that none should perish, but all should come to repentance. Maybe you're listening to this teaching today and you personally are not saved. I'd like to pray with you. And many of you that are listening, you have unsafe family and friends. I want to agree with you in prayer. Let's do that right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, let the words of God, like precious fertile seed, go forth and find fertile soil. I pray first of all for those who may be listening, who do not know Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. I pray that today would be their day of salvation, that they would recognize their sin, that they would repent of their sin, and that they even today would receive Jesus Christ. Thank you for the promise in the book of Romans, all who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Let that take place even now. Let the miracle of genuine conversion reach into hearts and lives, loose them and set them free. Those that are backslidden and away from the Lord, draw them back home. And now I join with every believer and we pray for unsafe family and loved ones. As was found in the scriptures today in Acts 16, you're a God who can perform the miracle of household salvation. You've done it in my family's name. You've done it in my wife's family name and for many others. Let that same anointing go forth from this broadcast today and give people faith now for household salvation. Eliminate every doubt that it's God's will for their flesh and blood to be saved. Eliminate every doubt, every lie of the enemy that says they'll never come to know Christ. You who are willing that none should perish, but all should come to repentance, I agree now for the salvation of every single person and their families and their loved ones in the mighty name of of Jesus. We take authority over the power of sin, whatever it may be, whatever binds them, whatever blinds them, whatever numbs their mind to spiritual truth. We command that to be broken. Let light shine in the darkness now and bring a multitude to salvation for the glory of God. Heaven is real. Hell is real. Eternity is real. Keep us all ready for the eternal life and the hope of heaven that you have promised and provided. And we ask it now in Jesus' mighty name. And all God's people said, Amen.
Thank you.